everyone in the precious and holy name of Jesus the Christ I greet you I greet you during these times like we have never seen before with so much happening and so much going on that is negative I want you to know that I come today feeling the weight and the pain of it all but I also come filled with the joy of the Lord, because the joy and the presence of the Lord is where I find my joy. And I hope I can say the same for you as we gather to be filled again, to hear, understand, and put in action the words of God from the scriptures. Let's see what Jesus is saying to us today. In the gospel found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. A long one again, but that's okay. Matthew chapter 22, come with me, come with me. Uh, verses 23 through 32. And now, my beloved, please hear the word of the Lord. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him, and he was teaching. And they said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Well, Jesus answered them, I also would ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come from? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we from heaven, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet, a preacher. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But then he continues, what do you think? A man has two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and he went. And, and then he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And the people said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. Oh, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward Change your mind and believe him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
And now I want you to pray with and for me. Oh Lord, as I come before your children, I ask that you would fill me afresh and anew. Fill me to overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you will use me to your glory by allowing the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Let them be seen before you, cleansed, renewed, and available. In Jesus' name I pray, cover me, Lord. As we begin our lesson, let me fill you in on what happened before our scripture lesson begins because it's important. Just, just a few verses earlier, you know, at the beginning of this chapter, we're told of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which, as Matthew tells it, ends with him making a scene at the temple, driving out the folk selling animals to sacrifice, overturning the tables of the money changers, and all the rest of it. Read it. And then after healing many sick, Jesus goes back to stay with friends of his in Bethany for the night, and, and in the morning he returns to Jerusalem. Now, now, the Gospel of Matthew tells us he returned to Jerusalem because he was hungry and he sees a fig tree on the side of the road and he, he goes up to it expecting to find something to eat. Oh, but when he gets there and he looks at it, he sees that the tree is barren. There's nothing on it but leaves. And in a fit of hunger-induced frustration, Jesus gets angry and so Jesus says in anger to the fig tree, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree immediately withered, it withered there in front of him. And then the disciples, they see this and they are amazed. They ask, how did it wither all at once? And Jesus responds to them, truly I tell you, if you have faith, and not only will you be able to do what's been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. And it's after having said that, that Jesus, he entered the temple, the church, and the chief priests, the pastoral staff, and the elders of the people, the older people, came to him as he was teaching. What do we find Jesus talking about? He was talking about the fig tree. And the fig tree becomes a potent image for what Jesus wants to discuss and was teaching to them on. Jesus will lift up the importance of, of bearing fruit, of taking action, of doing the work of God, of feeding the hungry, of clothing the naked, of visiting the sick and incarcerated, of granting mercy and forgiveness of working for justice. These are the fruits of the kingdom of God. These are, are what we're called to bear, to produce as Christians. And likewise, Jesus will call out those whom he sees as trees with nothing but leaves, nothing but fluffy stuff, nothing but talk. Ah, they may look full of fruit at a distance, but upon closer scrutiny, they are shown to lack substance. No growth, no real fruit. And the challenge, beloved, for us will be a familiar one, which is not to get too comfortable, church, and assume Jesus is talking to someone other than you and me. Somebody say amen. And so, beloved, Jesus enters the temple that day and the chief priests and the elders and the officials of the temple do what some officials are known to do when faced with an outside presence that they'd rather not deal with. What do they do? They check his credentials. 
And so they ask, by what authority do you do these things? They ask Jesus. Now, now hear what I say now. Yes, there, there are times when it's co completely legitimate to ask for credentials, even necessary sometimes. But, but there are also times when asking for some credentials is nothing more than a power move. A power move meant to intimidate, meant to make people feel less. And it happens in all sorts of ways. You know how it happens. So where do you live? Where did you go to college? Um, where, where did you say you work? I didn't ask you, but where are you from? It's a power move meant to intimidate or even worse, incriminate. And so I, I feel some obligation to say that the call for identification means different things to different groups of people. It made me think of people of color in America Yesterday, today, and hopefully not forever. All the stuff that we may have heard and the meaning of these questions. Listen, between the sad history of voter ID laws and routine traffic stops, and stop and frisk and ice raids, it's become painfully clear that asking for some ID for people of color has often meant exactly what the officials at the temple meant that day, which is, we don't think you're supposed to be here. By what authority do you do the things you do? <laughs> you see, they asked Jesus, wanting him to feel small and unwelcome, and yet Jesus was quick. Just how we all wish we were in, in moments like these. <laughs> he does what he does so well, which is to turn the question on them. So he says, answer me this. Was the baptism John the Baptist offered to people of God? Was it of God or was it just some crazy person? You see, you see, Jesus knew that many of those gathered were followers of his cousin, John the Baptist. So that was making it dangerous to, to the few who might go against Pastor John. So now they're in a tight. And of course the chief priests and elders want to say that John was just some crazy person, just some wild-haired madman preaching about the end times. Uh, but they also knew that John had a following of people. It, it helps to have numbers. After all, they were politically savvy. They, they knew uh, there were plenty of folks in the audience who, who thought John was a prophet of God. And plenty more who at least thought he was wronged by the authorities of the church to be headed over and handed over to Herod to be executed. So they answered in a way that, depending on how you look at it, either politically correct or cowardly. And yes, sometimes those can be one and the same. Somebody say amen. So they answered, we don't know. And Jesus tells them, well, if you won't answer me, I won't answer you. Somebody say amen. I love my Jesus, such a strong man. And no, he didn't answer their question. But then he continues to teach and talk about what he wanted to teach and talk about all the time. Because then Jesus begins telling them a parable. Sometimes you got to ignore people. And as far as parables go, you know, it's pretty straightforward. So Jesus started talking and he said, A man has two sons and he asked them to go out to work in the vineyard. One son at first answered, I will not. Uh, but later changes his mind and he does go out to work in the vineyard as asked. Well, now the second son, however, he says, I'll go, sir, I'll go. 
dangerous to ask and be a volunteer. You can't trust volunteers. He said, I'll go, sir. But in the end, he never does go out. Now Jesus asked these church people, or oh, which of these two did the will of the Father? The first one they answered. And so Jesus continued. Truly I tell you, all the people who you think are on the outside, but who accept the baptism of repentance, Pastor John offered the tax collectors and the prostitutes. They accepted it. They're like the first son. Oh, but all of you who heard his call to repentance and you did not change your minds or your ways, you're like the second son who said one thing but did another. All the scriptures are talking. This is deep. In other words, in other words, Jesus is saying, you're just like the fig tree over there, the one with lots of leaves, but no fruit. It's a sin when I hear some United Methodist people say, we may not have be rich in people, but we rich in property. Oh, God forgive them, for they know not what they say. So child of God, the tax collectors and prostitutes, those on the outside are said to have an inroads to the kingdom over and against the religious authorities. And why? Jesus tells them because the people who they leave out came in and repented. They changed. And the truth is everybody needs to repent to change. Because we all have fallen short of the glory of God. We need to do it from day to day to day. It's the saddest thing when people in the church refuse to change, to look at their sin. It's just so sad. It's just so sad. Now, beloved, can I teach a minute? Now, in Hebrew, the word for repentance literally means to turn as in to turn in a different direction, like the GPS. You say, get the opportunity, turn, make a U-turn to start on a new path. And the Greek is similar, which literally means to change your mind, but it's probably closer to having a change of heart. Action is still the key because blessed are the ones, Jesus said, who realized they needed to change, and, and they did. In fact, the word that's closer to what Jesus describes here is not a repent, but kind of like convert. Repentance can have a sense, you know, of feeling remorse, but to convert. This is, this is a true change. This is a drastic change. And in fact, to convert literally means to change completely. Or turn around for real. Is this word too much for us today? Is it too much? Don't you know, child of God, this was Jesus' message that day to those on the inside, there at the temple who would keep him and others on the outside? Jesus was saying that authority comes through action, not just words. Oh, words are important, incredibly important. Words are powerful, and we must always be careful when about what we say. Because if scripture is to be believed, it was words that brought all the creation into being. But just like at creation, words are only as powerful as the action that springs forth from them. Authority comes. Listen to me. From the fruit we bear. And the fruit Jesus lifts up here is the fruit that's so hard to bear, particularly for those on the inside, those who are saved, those who think themselves perfect, those who think they have the right answers for everybody. I never seen this one race of people just think they got the answers for everybody. Jesus is talking about the fruit of repentance. The fruit of confessing our faults and our failings and our sins. 
and turning in a new direction. Jesus says the ones with the authority spiritually are the ones who find strength enough to admit their mistakes and move in a new direction. Oh, somebody need Amen. And listen, the truth is that the church is struggling with this very thing. The church is struggling with it just like the chief priests and the elders did and just like any institution or individual with inside status. When they think they have struggled with it in some way, they struggle with change, struggle. This may be the greatest spiritual challenge for those people on the inside, that they do not think they need to change. They think they safe. <laughs> I'm, I'm a member of the church. They, they feel protected in some ways. But it's in this line of thinking that they are right and everyone else is just different kinds of wrong that has kept the church on the wrong side of not only history, but the gospel throughout the years. And which is why I think a lot of, of people have stopped listening to the church. They hear a lot of words, they see a lot of writing, they know about a lot of meetings, but not a whole lot of action. Not much repentance from church folk at all. And so the problem with white supremacy is that white people have never repented. I heard a white pastor say, my people just don't want to hear it anymore, so I don't talk about race. <clears throat> oh, I could say something, but I'm not. Then I thought, well, it's easy for them to say with the privilege of being a white person, that carries a privilege in this world. Oh, but a Christian, a Christian, a real Christian, is willing and anxious to do whatever it takes and give up whatever is needed to be given up to be in the will of God. There was a professor at a school of theology who just always went out of his way to find black students and offer any assistance he could give. And one day, I asked my friend, why is he so different from most of the other white professors? And his answer was, He's a real Christian. Amen. Amen. Beloved, with so much happening over and over and over again concerning this active issue of white supremacy, let me say with love that it is the white church that must own up to its own racism. First, the church must offer a variety of ways to give reparations for the damage she's done to people of color and then to take the responsibility to make drastic changes that the whole world can see. Let your light so shine. This sin on part of white people will never end without repentance before God and a change of mind and heart and a filling of the Holy Spirit. Listen, listen. I am witnessing companies funding and apologizing to black people. Companies. I cried looking at the special television program supplied by the National Football League around Black Lives Matter. And I've thought about this over these last several years as the drama has unfolded around NFL players standing or not standing or kneeling or remaining in the locker room for the national anthem. God bless them. And I can remember while serving in the Domestic Peace Corps in 1963 and 64 in Harlem in New York City, working among my people who were immersed in the poverty and the hopelessness and the dehumanization of black people. I remember when I too refused to sing or stand for the national anthem. I remember 
when I pastored a church in Compton, California for 20 years and, and once again fought the horrible effects of white supremacy that is still alive and well in real time. I had so many questions when I was in Compton and nobody really cared. My question, the, the gun and the drugs, where, where did they come from? The, the internalized racism, black-on-black -black crime, self-hate, where did it come from? The crime, the loss, the struggle to live, the hopelessness, the powerlessness of my people. Where did it come from? Oh, I know, and so do you, I know. And my question is this. Where was the church, the denomination I'm in in particular? Where was the church? Oh, I have a story to tell. I have a story to tell. Listen, I was there when we had an uprising, a protest in Harlem, New York in the 60s, and I was in Compton, California, and central Los Angeles, and and doing the uprising in the 80s. And still today, now, all over the United States of America, there are uprisings and protests saying, Black Lives Matter too. And it will never end until white people and those who think like them repent of racism and all the other isms. In our lesson today, Jesus is reminding us that true authority and power, influence and clout is found in the fruit we bear. Why are our churches empty? <laughs> Beloved, it's the hardest thing in the world to do. Change. I can remember when I was I was seething with anger toward white people. If you find black people who are not angry, there's something wrong with them. So, so I told God that, that I would never pastor or join a predominantly white church. And, and with that, God challenged me to join a white church. This was not many years ago. And because I want to really please God, I fear God, I did that. And it changed me. And I hope it changed them too. You see, you see, all the issues we fight over are trivial to the one thing that makes all good and all right, and that is love. And on this side of it, to change can feel like a kind of death. You know, you go from hate to love, and this is true. This is, this is the hard, hard part of following in the way of Jesus. Oh, but the good news, the good news, the story we proclaim and do our best to live is that there is a new life on the other side of hate and anger and indifference. There is new life, abundant life. The good news is that we, the church, can be born again, not tomorrow and years to come, but today. Let it happen suddenly like everything else is. I say, let's make it happen. Rise up church and, and do something tremendous and courageous. Do justice. Fight evil and change. Repent. Because we, we have the authority of Jesus Christ available to us so that we, we can rise up and make a challenge and make a change. So when it's all done and over, church, all we want to hear, all I want to hear God say is, well done. Well done. God bless you now. so much I have to say it at my age and experience about the things that are going on today as a result of white supremacy. So much to say. 
so much pain I've experienced. For one reason or another. It could have been because I was black. It could have been because I was female. And now it can be because I'm old. So if you have been a part of this podcast and it touched your spirit, please either subscribe or give us a thumbs up. And if you really want to be obedient to God's word, we ask that you go to our website and and give cheerfully. And then we hope that you will spread the word, spread the word. Spread the word, send it out as much as you can. Because the word will go forth and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And that is the fruit the church is called to produce. People by great numbers. Love you now. I'll see you next week. God bless you all. I don't feel to leave me